I have a couple of things I want to remind you of, and one of those is that now that we're getting through the Labor Day weekend, that means our Wednesday night Bible study and Kids College resume this Wednesday night. Uh, we have a number of volunteers, but Ed and Pauline Manus are the, the primary leaders in our Kids College, and so we're starting a new year this Wednesday at 6.30, and we'll be praying with you all and for others who will be working with you in that program I'll do the adult prayer and Bible study. Uh, that'll be me back in the uh, conference room. And uh, I do need to mention that our youth have moved from Wednesday night to Thursday night. Um, our school system, in their infinite wisdom, have planned activities on Wednesday nights. Uh, and so some of our kids could not participate. And so starting this week and through the school year, our youth will be meeting on Thursday nights. So uh, just to let you know about that, and if you have a young person, please share that information with them. But that's coming up. One other thing I need to mention is that, among other things, next Sunday is Minister Appreciation Sunday. And so I just give you a heads up about that so you can be preparing. <laughs> now, why would they laugh at something like that? I have no idea. All right. Stay with me, stay with me. We have some birthdays I need to mention. Diane, amen, and I love you too. Di Diane McDermott had a birthday yesterday. Diane, happy birthday. Hope you survived it. I survived mine. Margie Bishop has a birthday today. And so does, and so does Denise Willoughby. You thought you were going to get away with it, didn't you? No, no. All right. And there are some folks this week. Uh, Lisa Muser has a birthday this week. Please hold the door for her after church. <laughs> Debbie Hanrahan and Deb Pezzo also have birthdays that are coming up this week. <laughs> I always wanted to pastor an old Baptist church. I'm getting there. All right, I got it backwards, I'm sorry. I always wanted to be an old pastor of a Baptist church, and I'm getting there. Okay, all right, all right. Well, I can tell the natives are restless. Let's get to the sermon. We are indeed grateful to have Rich and Shelba back safely and back with us. We've missed you guys while you were gone, but I trust the Lord used the time redemptively, both for you and for the folks that you ministered to. So welcome home. And... Uh, Glad to have Marge Cook back with us today. Marge was in Mercy Hospital last Sunday, and she has advised me she would rather be here than there. How many of you will share that sentiment, all right? Raise your hand if you'd rather be here than in Mercy Hospital. Okay, so we're glad you all are here too, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. We do have some guests with us. In fact, one lady, and I apologize, I didn't get an opportunity to visit with you earlier. Maybe after the service we can speak briefly, but... I was told that she's here because she saw us on Facebook last week and came to worship, and we are grateful that you did. But to all of our visitors and our guests, we are glad that you are here. We are resuming our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so, uh, Aniston, if we can pull that up or whoever's back there and, uh, and get that started. There it is. And uh, as, we, as we go through this, I did an overview of chapter 6, and then I paused last week so that we might take a closer look at what we call the Lord's Prayer traditionally. It's actually a model prayer for us as His followers. And we looked at that last Sunday, and this Sunday I want to look at another which uh, I call a principle for living. And so let me just remind you of a couple of things as we, as we get started that the Sermon on the Mount came very early in Jesus' ministry. And these are the things that happened in Matthew's record just prior to his delivering the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the Sermon on the Mount is introduced by Matthew in this way. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And so everything we're looking at in the Sermon on the Mount are Jesus' instructions to disciples, to his followers. 
I was reading in a commentary this week as I was preparing for today's message, and one of the observations the author made was that the Sermon on the Mount was not an evangelistic sermon. And I'd never really thought about it that way, Walter, as, you know, as I've read through it and from time to time have preached from it, that it was not a sermon that was offered to the crowd or to the world, to lost people, it was offered to his disciples, those who had already committed to him and were his followers. And so as we think about that, as we, as we go through today's study, he's talking about us as Christians. And he's, he's seeking to equip us. He had in chapter 4 of Matthew just recruited his disciples. He's explaining to them what following him really means in their lives. And so want to talk with you this morning. Well, I call it a principle for living. If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin at verse 25 and read down through verse 34. And when it's shorter passages, I do put it up on the screen, but once in a while I like for you to have a chance to use your Bible. I don't want you to get out of the habit of bringing them. And in my Bible, this particular passage is headed, The Cure for Anxiety. There are lots of things to be anxious about or worried about in our world. If you go to Barnes & Noble, there is a whole section of books that are written about how to deal with fear, anxiety, phobias. Anxiety, I can't sleep. Denise, there are pills for that. To help you sleep or to ease your fears or to calm the anxiety. Anxiety is a real problem in our world. And so Jesus addresses that in the Sermon on the Mount. Follow along verses 25 through 34, and then we'll come back to it uh, for the, the particular portion for the message. He says, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you? O men of little faith, do not be anxious then, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I was going to say it's a good time to say amen indeed. And so Jesus raises the issue of anxiety, and he raises two very beautiful metaphors or illustrations. One of those are the birds of the air, the other the lilies of the field, and he uses those to, to emphasize to his disciples that God is capable of taking care of us. Now there's a concept for you to think about. God is capable of doing for me better than I am capable of doing for myself. Could you stand in front of a mirror and repeat that out loud and believe it? God is capable of doing for me better than I am capable of doing for myself. Now as we celebrate this Labor Day weekend, it's unfortunate that some folks will read that passage and interpret it that you're not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to just sit down, fold your arms, and God's going to take care of everything. That's not what it means at all. The birds have to build a nest. I mean, everybody has to work. And so Jesus isn't talking about work. He's talking about worry. He's talking about not if we work, but how we work. Okay? It's a difference between trying 
and trusting. And so the kernel of truth that is in that passage, verse 33, that Jesus offers us as that nugget, that insight, that diamond that we find, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's the principle for living, and I want to take a closer look at that, okay? The principle, seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness, it has a priority. Did you notice? First. And finally, the promise. All these things will be added. Now, let's take a little closer look at this principle. In the first place, let's ask, what is a principle? Well, a principle is a foundational truth, a philosophy of life, a choice that we make. Whenever I am faced with a choice between two different important things, my philosophy of life creeps in, and that's what influences what I do. And so Jesus offers his disciple a principle. Not that they were unprincipled. He's not offering a principle to those who don't have one. He's offering a better principle to those who already have one. You see, each of us have a way that we process the decisions we make every day. Your philosophy of life influences the decisions you make about how you dress, about what you eat, about where you go, about what you do or do not do. All of those things, and it just has a way of oozing in and creeping itself on us. And so we all have them. And so when Jesus said the principle is to seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness, what he's really encouraging his disciples to do deliberately, consciously, is to embrace God's authority in their lives. You remember he started with the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, telling us what kingdom life would be like. I'd shared with you before that Jesus was declaring a new kind of kingdom with a new kind of king. And so throughout chapter 5 and in the earlier verses of chapter 6, he lays for us that foundation of what he means by that, embracing God's authority and God's acceptable righteousness. Okay? You remember what he said in chapter 5? He would give us an illustration on six different things, in fact. He said, here's what the law says. Here's what the righteous people say. But I say unto you, and each time Jesus gave a contrast between what they said and what he said in the new kingdom. And so he gives them that contrast. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I can think of all these folks that were standing around hearing what Jesus was saying to his disciples, despairing and saying, well, then how can anybody get to heaven? The Pharisees are the most righteous people we know. And even some folks would aspire. The apostle Paul aspired to be a Pharisee. And Jesus says, that's not good enough. So how are we going to get there? And then you remember how he began chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount? Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by then. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And once again, Jesus offered six examples that we not do as the hypocrites do. And so in these two chapters coming up to this nugget of a principle for living, Jesus has laid the foundation that God's authority is a different principle in our lives than the principle that many of us live by. And that the righteousness that we pretend is insufficient to the standard of the righteousness that God offers us by faith in Jesus Christ. God's acceptable righteousness is not achieved righteousness. It's not manufactured righteousness. It's not pretend righteousness. It is authentic righteousness already accomplished in Jesus Christ. And it is accepted righteousness by all who accept Jesus Christ 
as Savior and Lord by faith. And so, so Jesus laid that out. So the, so the principle is to seek God's authority and God's acceptable righteousness in our lives. A principle, okay? Whenever I make a decision, will I get up and go to church this morning or will I not? Will I get up and have oatmeal or will I have an ice cream bar this morning or not? You, you, you see, in the most mundane and the most important decisions in our lives, our philosophy of life, the principle we choose to live by, governs and influences the decisions we make. Jesus says, here's a principle. Seek God's authority in your life, that He is Lord, and seek the acceptable righteousness to God in your life. Not the righteousness you would achieve, but the righteousness God would provide to you through Jesus Christ. Now, he says that's the principle, but there's a priority to it. And some of you are already ahead of me. You're saying, well, that can't be the only principle because sometimes I make decisions based on other things, and of course we all do. So he's not saying that we should make God's kingdom and acceptable righteousness the only thing, but he does say we should make it the first thing. I remember years ago someone called me and they had a problem. They said, Pastor, I'm asking you to pray with me about this. It's really important. I've tried everything else. And it suggested to me that they had their priorities out of order, you see. If I have a problem, prayer ought to be the first thing I think about, not the last thing. But oftentimes the temptation is, God, thank you very little. I can work this out myself. And then we find out we can't. And so there is that issue of first. Is he first in my life? Is God's principle the first principle by which I operate? And here's the thing, if it's not, there is the danger of serving a God who doesn't matter, an inconsequential God. Now, think about that for just a moment. What does that phrase really mean? It means that some people would be so bold as to say, there is no God. We refer to them as atheists, okay? Non-God people, okay? People who intellectually, emotionally, whatever other means, declare there is no God. I've checked everywhere and I can't find him, so he must not exist. Like the Russian cosmonaut who got into space and says, I don't see God anywhere. See, that wasn't a surprise, but that's what he declared. As though that was a conclusion. As though he'd searched everywhere and there wasn't. Now, the honest truth is in my life I have met fewer atheists than I can count on my one hand. I mean genuine, honest atheists. But I could not put in 10 bushel baskets the number of practical atheists I have met in my life. That is, those folks who if you ask them, say, of course I believe in God, but when you watch them, act as if they don't. See, They pretend that they're their own God and that they make their own decisions, and that they declare their own righteousness. They live their life as if God didn't exist, and it becomes practical atheism. Think about it for a moment. The implication of you sitting in this pew this morning, worshiping a God who can't do anything, a God who isn't here, a God who doesn't listen, a God who doesn't care. Consider the implication of that, you see. Over in Isaiah, Isaiah offers this to Israel of old, and through the Holy Spirit, God offers it to us through his word. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord God is everlasting strength. See, 
Jesus says, here's a principle. See, Let God be first in your life. Don't be guilty of practical atheism, of dismissing God to a corner of your life as a casual acquaintance. Occasionally somebody will meet me at the restaurant or a store or somewhere, and they, oh, you know so-and-so. Chuck Bauer is always good about talking to me about folks from Concord. Oh, you remember so-and-so. Well, I don't remember so-and-so because I wasn't there long enough. So I didn't meet those people, okay? Unfortunately, sometimes we treat God that way. Somebody says, do you know God? Oh, yeah, I saw him last Sunday, but yeah, he's an acquaintance. God desires to be much more than an acquaintance in our lives. That is a principle by which a Christian should live their life. First, first. But with the principle and the challenge of the priority, there's a promise. All these things will be added to you. Now consider that for just a moment. It's a difference between trying and trusting. I've done some dumb things in my life. Raise your hand if you've ever done a dumb thing. Okay, just want you to be able to identify with how I feel. Okay. I was a senior in high school. We were down in, at, uh, in Arkansas at a place called Cherokee Village. My family was there. My brothers had just gone through a YMCA sick, uh, swimming class. Okay. And my brother was six years younger than me. And we went to this lake, and they had a swimming area, and out the edge of the swimming area, they defined it with these floating barrels. And he challenged me that he could beat me to the barrels and back. I could not let that challenge stand unanswered. Do you understand that? Are you with me? Do you have a younger brother or sister that you just have to, okay, you know what that's like. And so there we went, and I got out to the barrels, and I got halfway back from the barrels, and I could not get to shore. And I'm standing there in about 15 feet of water, and I'm floundering. And I'm bobbing like a, a cork. I'm going up and down. I'm gasping. I'm just trying to stay alive. And about this time, a lifeguard sees my dilemma, and he comes out with a belly board. And when he gets to me, and I'm still flailing my arms trying to help him, he says, quit trying. Just trust me. Quit trying, just trust me. And he flopped me on that belly board like an oversized fish, and he hauled me to shore. It was the second most embarrassing time in all my life. The most embarrassing time was the last time Brenda won an argument. <laughs> well, I just want you to know I'm human, and also like to know you're still listening. Okay. Here's my point, see. He hauled me back to shore, and I'm gasping for breath, and I realized, I was at least smart enough to realize I could have died. I could have forfeited my life. And God said, that may be the best advice you've ever gotten. See, quit trying. Trust me. Lord, I think I can handle this one myself. And God says, you just think you can. Trust me. See, a principle with a priority. But there's a promise. Because our God is a promise-keeping God. There's a beautiful verse that Paul gives us over in 2 Corinthians in the first chapter. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Did you hear that? For as many as are the promises of God in Jesus Christ, they are yes. Therefore, he says, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. In my 72 years, I have never explored fully the power of God in my life. 
Now, that's as much a confession as an acknowledgement. And I suspect there are few of us here who could not say that. I have explored God's power. I have experienced God's power in my life in a number of ways. But I have never gone to the very limit, to the very edge of what God really is capable of doing in my life, you see. That's what we strive for. At least that's what Jesus is urging his disciples to do. To seek first God's kingdom. Explore the potential of God's authority and God's ability in your life. And Paul says, if you need any assurance that God's capable of doing what he says, just look at Jesus. See, He kept the biggest promise of all. The other promises... <laughs> Those are just small change to God. That's the one that really challenged him, and he met it fully. And so there's an epilogue, if you notice, verse 34. He says, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And here's the thing. Jesus is saying to his disciples that trusting God is a today principle, not a tomorrow principle. So if you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'm still trying to work this out myself, God says, why? See, Lord, tomorrow I'm going to turn this over to you. Next week I'm going to give you a chance to, to work in my life. God says, what are you waiting for? See, how much more do you need? It's a right now principle, not a later. I have made a decision that tomorrow I will quit procrastinating. <laughs> I think somebody ought to put that on a t-shirt. Tomorrow I will begin praying more. Tomorrow I will begin studying my Bible more. Tomorrow I will let God do in my life what he really wants to do. And God says, what's wrong with today? See. Paul said over in Philippians that, and by the way, Philippians is what we're going to be looking at in our Wednesday night Bible study the next few weeks. The subtitle of Paul's letter to the Philippians is called to joy. Paul has more to say about joy in his letter to the church in Philippi than any other of his churches that he writes to. Called to joy. Called to real happiness in the Lord. And he says, be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. Think about that. A peace so awesome, so encompassing, that I can't even figure it out. It's just a consuming peace in my life in the face of every circumstance. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, you're here this morning. I have a question for you. What are you worrying about? What are you really fretting about? in your life. God simply says, you don't have to do that. Trust me. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, there may be someone here this morning who indeed is struggling with a troubled heart, something going on in their life, something in their world that they've become to realize is bigger than they are, and they're concerned with how they'll face it, how they'll confront it, or even how they'll overcome it. Lord, I pray that you would just let your Holy Spirit speak words of assurance to their heart. Let them hear you say to them, I've got this. Help us, Lord, that we might indeed quit trying so hard and start trusting. Lord, I thank you that in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have affirmed to us everything that you are and everything that you've promised. And Lord, if there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, may they come to Him this morning only to find with assurance that You said exactly what You meant 
when you said, for God so loved the world. Father, if there's someone here and there's some other decision that they need to make, they need a church family where they can grow and thrive in their service to you. Bid them come if that's your will. If there's someone here who has a burden upon their heart, perhaps not by coming to me, but right where they are, they would say, God, let you and me talk about this. And then they would listen. May this be a time for us to revisit the principle, the priority, and the promise that Jesus gave us. We ask this in His name. Amen. Stand with us, please. We're going to sing as our hymn of invitation. Hymn, Johnny, and the folks will lead us. Excuse me. And as we sing that hymn, Jesus is tenderly calling. If He's calling to you, are you listening? Johnny. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling to calling to Fly from the sunshine of the world alone, farther and farther away. Calling to Come, and I'll, I'll try to help okay. you a little bit, but you fill in the blank okay. for us, okay? <laughs> Jeff and Cheryl have carried a heavy burden over these last several months, and we have talked and prayed together about it, but she shared with me a blessing that she just saw a milestone achieved yesterday. We're talking about her son, and uh, he has a, a terrible burden in his life, some habits that he's tried to overcome and has struggled with, and it's affected his ability to, to be a father, to be a son. But uh, share with me a little bit about yesterday, can you? Yes. Oh, give me just a second. Yes. Okay. okay. My son Michael has been on the prayer list for a long time, and I removed him, and um, he put himself into rehab and left it. 
and I was disappointed, and he is back in rehab. He just did 49 days of not doing drugs, and he's found the Lord, and he's in a Christian, yes, he's in a Christian environment, and um, I, we spent the day with him yesterday, and we are so happy and thankful. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. There's a reason God had me quit my sermon a little early. He wasn't finished with you yet. Cheryl beautifully said, and uh, I couldn't ask for a better illustration of what I was saying earlier. And indeed, we trust in the Lord. And it's not just Michael's life that we're concerned about. He has a precious child, and you all have been carrying that burden and trying to help in that re way as well. And we just continue to pray for you. But uh, Jeff, I see your mom's with us again. Welcome back. We are glad to see you and trust you're continuing to gain strength and wonderful. God bless you. Good to see you. By the way, Amen. Amen. And, and that's a challenge we all face. Welcome home, girls. Good to see you. How's it gone so far? Nobody flunked out? No, okay. <laughs> Welcome home to both of you. I didn't see you till I got up there a moment ago. Delighted to see you. Good to see some of you. I know some have been gone and coming back and, and others are gone now. And then, as I said earlier, we have guests with us. So take time to greet each other in the Lord before you leave this morning. And I do hope that you have an opportunity to celebrate this Labor Day uh, in a safe and proper way. Of course, Labor Day came into being as a, a way of acknowledging the American labor movement. Uh, I was listening to something on the TV this morning as I was getting ready for Sunday school. Uh, somebody said that 10% of the American workforce is now represented by organized labor. And so, uh, you know, my dad was a union laborer all of his life and... and uh, uh, I acknowledge the value of unions, but I also know that there are changes that have come about in our society, and, and uh, so there are a lot of issues there. But I hope that you can celebrate Labor Day, and if you are a union worker, I do thank you, and I thank God for you and, uh, and your faithfulness. So let's stand together. Oh, yes, John. I neglected to uh, mention our choir practices resume this Wednesday at 745, and we'd love to have you. If you've never been part of the choir or if you've been a long time ago or whatever, we'd love to have you. We also have our Christmas cantata music available, so um, we'll be issuing those books as well. Okay, and Rhonda, did, oh, okay. Okay, Rhonda's going to be available, and there'll be someone out in the front for you. If you'll sign up to help us with our uh, fall festival next month, there are lots of different jobs that we, we need help with, and we would appreciate your help very much. We continue to pray for Michael. As we go to the Lord together in our closing prayer, I'm glad you're here. Pray that until God brings us together again, he will keep you in the hollow of his hand. Rich, I'm going to hand you the mic. Lead us in our benediction, please. Father God, it's such a blessing to see people that turn things over to you, Lord. And we know that you answer all prayers. And Father, we just thank you for this. We thank you most of all for sending your son who died on the cross for us. Thank you. Keep everyone safe this holiday weekend, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.